I came to the acceptance with myself that even if I never made an Olympic team, the fact that I was able to do what I loved and train as a pro runner and live this dream, like this has been a dream my whole life to be a pro runner. Even if I never achieved that highest goal, it was still going to be worth it for me. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 193 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, for being here today. And if this is your first time of listening to Running For Real, welcome. I am excited to have you. I hope you become a longtime listener like many of our listeners who I appreciate so much. And uh, I'm going to enjoy getting to know you over the coming years. Now, last week, we were fortunate enough to have an episode with Lindsay Krauss. Now, Lindsay Krauss has done a lot to change things within the women's running world. Uh, She has done all these pieces in the New York Times that have changed so much with dream maternity, with bringing out Mary Kane's story of emotional abuse, with bringing out Alison Felix's story of how she was treated when she had a baby. Uh, She's also covered some inspiring things like Mimo. I don't know if any of you remember the video of just this really hardworking guy who lives in New York, just uh, he's he's fast, but not not at the top level. But she's covered so many things, and uh, it was great to talk to her, get behind the scenes, and learn what she is all about, and talk about the future of running, especially when it comes to young girls running. So I really enjoyed that episode, and I hope you did too. Now today, I am excited to bring you someone who has really kind of made waves this year with her performance at the 2020 US Olympic Marathon Trials, where she finished second, beating a lot of very experienced, talented runners who also took to the tough Atlanta course. Molly and I do discuss this breathtaking debut marathon of hers, but we also go way beyond the performances and good races to talk about other parts of her journey that have led to this moment. Molly, as you're going to hear, is very real, very honest. She talks a lot about her eating disorder and we do talk about this pressure that she had on herself as a teenage phenom. She has managed to do some things that no one has ever done before and that adds a lot of pressure. This episode is going to show you Molly's story in a way you haven't seen anywhere else and I can't wait to see what she has going on in the future, you know, besides going to the Olympics with her future running journey. I want to warn you that, as I said, this can be sensitive at times. We do talk a little bit about her eating disorder. I don't think anything is going to be triggering, but I just want to give you a warning I will have links in the show notes to the National Eating Disorder uh, Association's uh, hotline and website. So if you are struggling with an eating disorder, I strongly recommend you go there. I also will make sure I put links in there to the episodes of my podcast, which particularly discuss nutrition and uh, eating disorders in, in detail to help you with if that is something you are working through. Now you can get those show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 193. And I want to thank Tracksmith. Ultra and Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode. Let's go give one of those a thanks and we'll get right to the episode. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running Frill podcast. Athletic Greens is the ultimate daily all-in-one supplement with 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients that work together to help the body absorb and synthesize these nutrients in a highly bioavailable form. It was initially developed for athletes and high performers, but it has since kind of grown in popularity amongst everyone. And you guys are seeing why. I love hearing about how much you are enjoying Athletic Greens and they have such a high retention rate. Very few people cancel once they are subscribed to get this product every month because it works. Honestly, I get a little panicky when I'm in towards the end of my packet of Athletic Greens because I just can't imagine not having it there in my daily life. So I get a bit worried until the next uh, subscription arrives. I actually honestly asked them for a few months in advance just so I could take that part of the stress away from me. But I that's how much I believe in this product. I also gave some to my mailman during, I gave a month's worth to my mailman during the height of the kind of 
quarantine lockdown situation because I was just worried about him and I knew how much he was at risk. If I could give this to all of you, I would. I could not believe in a product and what it does for our just general health more than I believe in Athletic Greens. Uh, it boosts our energy. It, it gives you mental clarity. It supports your immune system. It stimulates your digestion, supports gut health. It makes changes in your skin, your hair, your nails. And I said 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. That is the antioxidant equivalent of 12 servings of fruits and vegetables to start off your day. So I know I'm always getting those important, hard to find nutrients that I am honestly not getting in my daily life. I haven't fallen sick in a while and I really pride that to Athletic Greens. I cannot be more excited about it in case you couldn't tell. Now you can get 20 servings of Athletic Greens for free by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get 20 free servings valued at $79 with your first order. Do not wait. Go check it out. You will not regret it. Molly, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For All podcast. I am excited to have you here and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to a great conversation here. So thank you for, for giving me the time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is going to be fun. And I have, you know, I've been looking forward to this one. It's funny when you, after you ran the trials, um, I don't know if you know this, but all the podcasters were kind of scrambling around trying to figure out how to get you on an interview. And it seemed like you didn't really go on many. and so. I had said all along, I was like, I want to get Molly in the summer. Like I want things to like calm down and then I can kind of ask her about how she's reflecting and how she's feeling about the going into the Olympics. And I kind of envisioned this as like a, a pre-race kind of, uh, interview. Obviously that has now changed. Um, and we're going to go on to talk about what happened at the U S trials, what's happening now. But for many people listening who are kind of fans of road running and marathon in particular, it may have seemed like you just burst onto the scene. Like you were this, you know, there was all the expected people of Des Linden and Molly Huddle and and Steph Bruce and all these kind of experienced marathoners and that you were this kind of, I don't know, breakout runner who had appeared from nowhere. Although those who know the sport better and that go through, you know, all areas of the sport track and field and everything know that that was definitely not the case, that there was a lot um, that you had achieved before that, even uh, breaking the, what do they call it? The curse, the high school curse. Or oh something. my God. Yeah. The, the um, damn curse. Foot Locker kept get or uh, not Foot Locker, uh, Flow Track kept really pushing that my, my senior year cross country and specifically Gordon was like, oh, are you worried about the curse? The, the quote unquote curse that no one who has ever won Foot Locker Nationals in high school has ever won NCAA Nationals at the collegiate level. And truthfully, I thought it was pretty silly, but they kept trying to push it, kept trying to push it. So um, I'm glad that I was able to break it. And I kind of thought it was all, all, all a bunch of bunk. But do you think any part of it had been mental for people? Like, do you think any part of it was that not necessarily like, oh, there's a curse, but kind of almost oh, never, no one's ever done it before. That makes it so hard. Do you think any, like you obviously said you thought it was silly, but do you think any part of it could played a role? I think it's less about that and more about the fact that it is extremely difficult to be a high level runner in high school Mm -hmm. and to keep that going. Mm -hmm. And even me specifically, I really struggled my first two years of college. I came out of high school basically having won every race that I was in And then I go to the collegiate level and it's this next step up and you're away from home for the first time. And, um, I had a different coach and I just struggled a lot. And truthfully, I don't think those first two years I ever thought I would win an NCAA championship. And I think that happens more often than not for a lot of collegiate runners that they're Mm -hmm. extremely successful in high school. And then you're thrown into a completely new thing and all of a sudden you don't thrive. So I would think it's less about a quote unquote curse and more just the struggles that female collegiate runners face. And luckily I was kind of in the minority that are able to then like make it through that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that even goes across beyond just the very top, like the people like you, you know, winning Foot Locker, winning, or even being top 10. But I I see that so much in college athletes who go from high school, they're in their small town of a thousand people and they win everything and then they go to college and suddenly they're fifth, sixth, seventh on the team or even not on the team. If you went to, you know, a really, um, 
a big school and suddenly they're like, wait, what? Like, I'm not the best. And it's, it's really hard. And I could imagine, you know, for you having won national championships, you kind of, it would have, it, of course, your, your brain back then would have been like, well, yeah, okay, maybe I won't win my first year, but maybe I'll be top 10, you know. Um, <laughs> but the the intensity from high school to college is just so much uh, greater than it was. And um, so I just want to give a few uh, people listening a few more things. So we'd said about the Foot Locker, we, she obviously have uh, alluded to that she did win uh, NCAA Division One titles at cross country, indoor 3K, indoor 5K and 10K, correct? Those are the four? Mm, yep. But then, you know, it seems like every year after that, uh, second to Molly Huddle at the 2017 USATF 5K Road Championships, you represented the US in 2018 at the Great Edinburgh Cross Country uh, Race, which I would love to talk about the race because that course is so hard and just I love that course. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. If you <laughs> love cross country, like proper cross country, that is the best. Um, I, yeah, I, I have such fond memories of that course, but um for people who are used to running on golf courses, it's not really, <laughs> not really that. Yeah. American cross country is nothing on European cross country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and then, you know, uh, second place at the, uh, 2018 USA cross country championship. So pretty much something every year, you know, c- constantly improving, constantly finding ways to, um, you know, come out onto the scene. And so I wanted people to know that, you know, it may have appeared to some like Molly just broke out of nowhere, but she she definitely had showed the promise. And I do want to talk about the Olympic trials, but, you know, just going back to the beginning, I want to kind of work through your journey um, and uh, go from there. So, you know, you obviously started running, you were running in high school, doing well. Tell us about when you kind of showed your first signs of like, wow, I actually am pretty good at this. And was any part of it related to your sister running and seeing it as kind of like our family is quite a good thing? Do your parents run? What was the early situation? No. So I actually came from a family where it's a very athletic family. Both of my parents were like kind of like good all around athletes, but nobody ran. Um, our family sport was actually ski racing, both downhill and cross country skiing or Nordic as it's mm-hmm. um, more widely known. And so when I then wanted to run, I found out that I was pretty good at it from running in gym class, joined my church's track team, um, was good through middle school. But then once I got into high school, even despite the fact that I was at a very small high school, I was the only one on the team, um, won state titles year after year after year. So knew I was pretty good, but didn't really realize like at the national level, how good I could be until my senior year Mm -hmm. when I qualified for Foot Locker Nationals and then won Foot Locker Nationals and got a full ride scholarship to Notre Dame. So it was, uh, I think it was actually really nice coming from a family that didn't run because Mm -hmm. my parents were extremely supportive in that, but they realized the benefit of doing different sports every season. Like I would not run in the winter. I'd just ski race and they would come to all my track meets, but they would never, never put undue pressure on me. Um, All the pressure on me was yeah, was what I put on myself. But yeah, they, they still continue to be extremely supportive, even if they don't fully understand the sport. I think that's so important that you mention that because I think, I, I mean, I've definitely experienced this, not so much, neither of my parents ran or particularly athletic other than just playing sports when they were younger. But, um, I, I think we mentioned about the, the kind of curse or the struggle between transitioning from high school to college, but when a, a high school athlete or even a middle school athlete is is good. There is so much pressure placed on that child. And, you know, at at this crucial point in your development, and you, as you said, you see it so often people don't make it through. And I think a lot of it does end up being either parents or coaches or someone saying like kind of exactly what you have, people would dream for their child, what happened for you, or you're going to be an Olympian one day. Um, and as you said, having parents who understood the importance of, cycling through seasons taking time away from that sport and not putting pressure on to a to a level that makes you feel like I have to perform like I really think that is what saves people and makes it so that they can get past it but that's my personal opinion what is your experience with that been because you even you know being around it you would have seen a lot of this growing up getting to know the other high school runners who were doing well and things like that Well, yeah, because especially as I started getting into the more like national caliber, I would see people around me whose parents were constantly pushing them, constantly driving them. And 
I think it leads to a lot of burnout in the sport for people who are super young because they're driven to succeed, but I don't think they know why they're driven. Mm -hmm. And because I was doing this from a young age, but it was kind of like, I became very self-sufficient with it being on a team where it was just me. Like there were a lot of times where I would go out and just run by myself. And so it was like, I had to learn from a young age, like, even if you don't want to run, like you still go out and do it just because you'd have to get it done. And like the, my parents weren't telling me to do it. My, my coach wasn't like cracking the whip on me. It was just cause I wanted to go run. Mm-hmm. And I think because my parents weren't forcing me to do it, it made me kind of like develop this love for it on my own. Yep. And it was something that was fully mine. Yes. Like I love racing. I say that ski racing is my first love, but running is my true love because it's something that I developed in myself. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. And so, so where did the pressure start coming in? When, when do you first remember kind of feeling a like, Oh, you know, I gotta, I gotta perform. Was it internal? Was it other people in, you know, high school media saying you got to perform or where do you remember pressures first starting to kind of pile onto you? Yeah, I would say it's a combo of internal and external. Obviously, there's the people after, because I won state my freshman year, I won cross country. This is in high school, one cross country, and then two outdoor state titles in the mile and the two mile. And after that, it's obviously like once you win, people expect you to win again. Mm -hmm. And then just putting the pressure on myself, I remember I would have this irrational fear every single year uh, that like, because I wouldn't run over the winter, I'd be ski racing and, and still staying in shape. But I would have this horrible fear, like, oh my God, what if I've forgotten how to run? What if I don't know how to do this anymore? And just that constant fear of like, oh, will this be like taken away from me? And so I think a lot of that is just like in, yeah, within myself. It's not like there were people who were telling me you have to keep winning or we're not going to like you anymore. I think it's just in my own head. That's immediately where my brain goes. And that's just kind of my own struggle with anxiety. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's hard because I feel like the person who's hardest on me is myself. So that's why it's nice that my parents aren't like cracking the whip on me because I feel like it would just be kind of this negative spiral. So right now it's always my parents bumping me up and like, no, we love you no matter what and whatnot. And I'm like, no, I'm worthless or whatnot. And so <laughs> it's nice having that counterbalance to my own like neurotic tendencies. Mm-hmm. And and how did you, did you deal with that pressure somewhat? Well, what, what did you use in, in, in high school and, and maybe going on into college when you were kind of struggling with, with the pressure, how did you remove it from yourself? Looking back now, I realized like, I don't know if it's maturity, just being older, but I feel like my relationship with the sport is a lot healthier now Mm -hmm. than it was then because previously, like in high school, I feel like a lot of my identity was wrapped up in running. Like I was Molly B runner, like, and I, I think I struggled a lot with that. And I think that's why ultimately when I got to college, I struggled a lot with it because I think everything about my personality was kind of formed around running. And I think that happens to a lot of young runners. It's something about running as a sport. People kind of latch onto it as their personal identity more so than in other sports. Mm -hmm. And we kind of look to it as being like the focus in our lives and this all encompassing thing that helps us discover ourselves. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just a sport. And I think I realize that now being 25 years old and having been through enough ups and downs to be like, no, like I am a person outside of this, but I really don't think I had a healthy relationship with it when I was younger. And it's, it's something that I've really had to work at over the years to separate myself from just that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of an ongoing thing for all of us as runners. I think we all go through waves of where we are able to remove our identity and, and then where we kind of get suckered back in and, um, I, I don't know if we ever truly are able to to just remove ourselves from that, especially in this social media world where I think about this a lot, how, you know, if you think about if you were going to see, you know, an aunt or an uncle or you saw a family friend or someone, the first thing they're going to ask you about is your running, not even necessarily because they know and are interested, but it's because that's what they see on social media. That's what you're posting saying, did my run today for, you know, the running community who are interested, but for them, what they see is, wow, this person is thinking about running a lot. That must be what they want to talk about. 
And then so they, you know, then these people start bringing it up to you all the time. And as you know, when you're injured, it's just a nightmare Uh, because every person asks you and you're just like, please don't ask me that question. Yeah. It's just like, Oh, how's your foot doing? How's your hip doing? I'm like, I don't want to talk about this right now, but no, I, I 100% agree with you. I think like it is very difficult not to be completely like boxed into that part of your personality because it is like Mm -hmm. now. And because it's my job, it's like, I think we're in our culture, we're definitely driven to kind of associate like, Oh, what do you do? I, I am a runner. Like, and I've really worked hard through years of therapy and whatnot to be like, no, I am a person who runs, but there are a lot of other aspects of me. Mm -hmm. It's just that running is definitely the most visible and, and social media is its own fricking bag of, (laughs) yeah, bag of issues (laughs) specifically because I try to keep the, I want to be very open on my social media. Mm -hmm. And, but I also think of that as like, that is Molly, the runner on social media. And because I, it's very connected to my running. That's what people know me for. And I truly don't put a lot of things about my my personal life on there. I don't feel that it's appropriate for me to be putting on like relationships that I'm in or super like in-depth stuff about my family. That is mm-hmm. Molly the Runner's Instagram account. And I feel that I need to separate certain parts of my personal life from that, sure. um, even though I do want to be open. But yeah, yeah it's it's difficult. It's really hard wrangling with that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad that you say that because I think many people listening will understand that. And, and I definitely do. I keep getting people, I mean, as we're recording this, I'm, uh, you know, third trimester of my pregnancy running about 12, yes, 12 mm-hmm. miles a week. And, um, and people keep saying, Oh, you're really busy. That's impressive while you're- <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. But, um, <laughs> people are like, Oh yeah, you're running all the time. And I'm like, well, not really. No, that's probably about like an hour and a half or two hours of my week, but, um, that's what they see. So that's what they assume I do. So, um, yeah. all right, moving on. So you went into college at uh, Notre Dame and being one of the kind of runners of the future, as we said, you're definitely kind of not allowed to just, or that you're not in a position to where you can just kind of get on about with your business. You're definitely in the spotlight. People are like, what's going to happen with this person? How are they doing? Did you feel the pressure intensify a lot when you came into college? And and again, at that point, what happened there with kind of handling the pressure? Uh, yeah, when I first got into college, it was really difficult. I, I struggled from a health standpoint. I was getting injured all the time. I did not have a good relationship with my college coach. And I think it's difficult because as and I think this is a problem inherent to women's collegiate sports is that there's very little room to accept women kind of growing into their bodies. And I think it's fairly natural for a lot of women, especially as they go from girls to women, that your bodies are developing and you're not necessarily going to have linear progression that a lot of men would. I think it's like widely accepted that men from freshman year of high school to senior year of college are just going to be like constant, steady improvement. And a lot of women, you're going to have a lot of ups and downs as your body develops. And I don't think right now that there is a, I don't think collegiate running has figured out a way to deal with that. So it's when people kind of struggle occasionally when they get into college and as they're kind of growing into themselves, it's, it's definitely difficult. And I, uh, I'm trying to, did you, so when did you see a physical, like for you, did you notice your body changing like uh, as it was happening or like, did you just start Kind of, and, and most girls do just go through a year or two of struggling because their body is kind of in this transition period. And, you know, I've had plenty of people on the podcast uh, talk about uh, Shannon Oseka, Cara Goucher. Uh, those are the two that come to mind, but many others. Was it, did you see it happening or was it kind of struggling to keep up? Like what was, what happened physically that you noticed and then thought, okay, I have to control this or I have to change this? Yeah, it definitely is like noticing, like I had like, gained weight when I got into college. And just part of that is, yeah, going from a high schooler to like being in college and my like coach would kind of get on my case about it. And like, I was still running and training, but then I think that kind of led into a lot of my like unhealthy body image stuff of like being reminded about it. Now realizing that I wasn't like a a high school kid anymore. And like, Ah, yeah, it's difficult because there's so much stuff wrapped up in that. And it's like, you want your body to like be able to develop 
naturally, but like there's so much about our sport that it's not necessarily natural about kind of what we're doing to our bodies and the amount of stress that we're putting on our bodies. So yeah, as I was going through like various injuries and like definitely like going from being a high schooler to a woman in college, it's, it's hard. And I don't think that my original college coach that I had for my first two years made that any easier. Mm -hmm. Um, had a lot of negative conversations and then just the pressure of like directly being told like there, there were conversations that I was a waste of a scholarship. There were conversations that I was not living up to my potential. There was, yeah, a lot of negativity, um, in those first two years. And I think that even then when that coach was asked, to leave the university of Notre Dame and my coach Sparks came in my junior year then. Um, and then he had a much healthier approach to it. I still was carrying a lot of that baggage and I still carry some of that baggage. Yeah. It's, it's something when you hear that from a really young age, a really Mm -hmm. vulnerable age, and you so badly want the validation of a coach, Mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm still kind of unraveling a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think, you know, as you said, it's something that, that, you know, affects you for life. And, um, I've said, I I mean, I don't know how much you know about like my background, but it was similar thing, a comment from a coach. I heard thing, I've never actually said this before, but I heard things saying, uh, we'll cut her scholarship. She'll never fight it because she's from England, things like that. Coach got left after a year, thankfully, but yeah, same as you damage was done. And I actually said recently, I I saw that coach in an airport and I, I was, I was, I was nice to him and I, I gave him a hug. But then afterwards I was like, why did you do that? Like, why didn't you like yell at him and say, do you realize like what you did to me? Um, but I just, I just didn't, I was just like, you know what, be a bigger person. But part of me wishes I'd yelled at him and been like, you screwed me up. Um, but yeah, I think yeah. it's so well, And I think there's so much about it. Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of times there's not necessarily an appreciation for women sports in general, and we're appreciating that women's sports are inherently different than men's mm-hmm. sports. And our coach would tell us like, you need to stop being so emotional. You need to stop acting like girls and running like girls. And it's like, I feel like you need to appreciate that the mental side is almost more important for women's running. You yeah. can't just yell at us and tell us to quit being pussies and to go faster. Like you can with boys. It's you need to appreciate that girls running is very tied up in the emotional aspect mm-hmm. and that our bodies are different than men's bodies. but. Yeah, that's just its whole, yeah, that's its own whole deal. Do you think it's being 25 now? If I, when I went to, I saw, I was at Cross Country Nationals Division One a year or two ago, and I saw from what I thought looked some differences in the shapes of bodies, the kind of people coming across the line um, that I felt positive about it. From what you see, do you think things are changing with with the way that coaches are treating athletes? Are they treating them differently and with the kind of you've said before about you saw many women running well with a low body weight, which I absolutely saw the same thing, felt I was the big one kind of thing. Do you see a difference now? Yes. I actually, over the last couple of years, feel like I have seen, it's not necessarily an earth shaking Mm. amount of change, but there is change there in kind of a positive direction. And I feel like there's a lot more acceptance within the sport for this even just at university of Notre Dame, I feel like there has been a very positive movement. And, um, part of that is that sparks who's my coach there. We kind of went through it together when I was dealing with the worst of my eating disorder, he had just come in. He'd never dealt with a situation like that. And I feel like, like sparks and I are still very close. And we kind of talk about how it was a big learning moment for him as well. So now he's able to, to see it better and Mm. to respond to it better. And they've, they've dealt with instances like that since then. But I think from experiencing that with me, where it was horrible for him to have to go through too, like, he's like a second dad to me and having to watch me go through that and not knowing what to do. I think it does take a certain amount of learning. And I think the sport is learning. And then as coaches learn about it, as we get more female coaches into the NCAA, I think things will continue to change. So there's positive movement, but there's still a ways to go. 
thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Tracksmith is a Boston-based brand led by a group of runners who are committed to making classically stylish, cutting-edge apparel. You've been hearing me talk about these products and they have one simple goal, to craft the most considered products on the market for runners dedicated to the personal pursuit of excellence. Now, I have been so inspired over the previous month seeing you guys out there finding your own version of excellence, chasing goals that you don't even know when you're going to race, getting yourself out there, pushing yourself and doing these runs that you don't have to do. No one is making you do it. There isn't a goal race on the agenda. Well, we don't know for sure that there are any goal races on the agenda to kind of keep you motivated. The motivation right now has to be from internal. And I have loved seeing it. And Tracksmith is so inspired by people who are out there doing that. That is you. Tracksmith designs all their products to solve the kind of problems that runners face, whether that's a a breathable long sleeve shirt that can be reworn without washing or the perfect short to go for your long run with room for your keys, phone and fuel. Tracksmith sweats the details so you don't have to. Now, my friends, uh, right now, if you are a first time Tracksmith customer, you can get 15% off your order by going to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina Muir. That's T R A C K. S-M-I-T-H dot com forward slash T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R to get 15% off your first order. Or you can switch it and go to tinamuir.com forward slash tracksmith. And I will show you my favorite items that I am really enjoying. And you can go straight from the links on my website directly to those items on the Tracksmith page. I've made it nice and easy for you with that. I'm really enjoying the Twilight Tea right now. It is an ultra lightweight training tea that's built to be a workout staple. The hardworking pieces in Tracksmith's Twilight collection were inspired by those summer traditions of Twilight track meets, under the radar races that are perfect for testing fitness. Those might not be going on right now, but it is just, it's bring back so many more warm memories for me thinking about those meets. So that has a personal meaning to me, these Twilight teas. They are made from Light as Air Bravio blend, which is a unique Italian micro mesh that is silky soft, moisture wicking, and incredibly cool against your skin. I absolutely love these products, especially all the items in the Twilight long sleeve. And friends, you, this is time to go make your best of that offer. Go to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina Muir, enter code Tina to get 15% off your order. As coaches learn about it, as we get more female coaches into the NCAA, I think things will continue to change. Yep. So there's positive movement, but there's still a ways to go. Oh yeah. Long way to go, I would say. And for you was, you know, you mentioned about the eating disorder and kind of, we've already said the feeling pressure to look a certain way. When would you say the line kind of blurred between it being purely about performance and kind of change to, I need to look like those other women, if it did get that way? So a lot of mine is not even necessarily wrapped up in body image stuff. Like obviously Mm -hmm. my first few years, it was a desire to like look a certain way that my coach wanted me to look. But I found that the majority of my eating disorder specifically, and I think this holds for a lot of women, it's a control mechanism for anxiety. I, I have dealt with OCD since high school basically. And when I don't have positive control mechanisms in order to work with that, um, it directly affects itself on eating. And I think this happens for a lot of women that it's a way to control anxiety. And so it wasn't even necessarily as I went through, it can change. And a lot of it was, I felt like the world was just kind of spinning out of control. I had no control over anything. I was stressed with school. I was stressed with running Mm -hmm. and it's really easy to be able to control what you eat, what you put into your body. And at the worst of times for me, what, like if it led to bulimia, yeah, the being able to use that as like a very direct control mechanism. So I think that a lot of times it isn't necessarily even about the eating and that's why it's so hard to treat because you have to really kind of like dig down into the root causes of eating disorders. It's not kind of a one size fits all solution to this. Yes. Okay. And, and actually this kind of leads in, uh, uh, this is going to come a bit, it's kind of a bit out of order, but you did go in I was going to bring this up later, but it kind of seems to be topical right now. So you did go into an eating disorder treatment uh, center for four months um, and spent two years in therapy. But from what you've said there, this, I have such a hard time trying to explain to people who say, I just want to fight this on my own. 
I, I can't afford to to pay for therapy or I, I don't want to see a dietitian. You know, I know what I should be eating. It's almost the worst when I see people who are in college doing a diet, dietetics, dietetics, I can't say the word, um, degree where they know what they should be doing, but they are obviously somewhere not quite getting enough. But as you have said, you know, it, it's it's about the control. It's about something else. And the amount of people that say to me, well, I just need to get my eating back under control and then I'll be fine. And I'll say, no, no, if you don't do the therapy that actually sorts out what's going on underneath, it's going to come out somewhere else. It's going to find a new way to suck you in and take over your life until you deal with what is going on underneath. So you going into a treatment center, for those deep down who know, you know, something's going on, I'm having some control issues with food, you know, maybe not quite ready to accept uh, an eating disorder, but I'm really feeling this anxiety. Um, why would you say it's important to, you know, go in to get treatment or at least get some kind of help to deal with the kind of mental side of what's going on rather than just looking at what's healthy to eat or how many calories you should be eating online? Mm -hmm. When the when I hear people say those things, the, Oh no, I can do this on my own. I just need to figure out my eating. I am just so immediately brought back to me at my worst, because those are the things that I thought when mm -hmm. I was at my worst, when mm -hmm. I was 95 pounds down 20 pounds from my healthy weight and just thinking, Oh, I just need to figure out the right foods to eat so that I can get up to a quote unquote healthy weight again. Mm -hmm. Going into a treatment facility or getting very targeted therapy helps so much because eating disorders thrive in isolation. They thrive when you're just stuck in the echo chamber of your own head and you don't have anyone objective to be able to tell you how disordered your own thinking has been. Because it's not just the eating that's disordered. It's the relationship that you have with food. It's the relationship you have with your own anxiety and with your own thoughts. And when it's just your own thoughts pinging around in your own head, I almost think of it, it's just like this constant spiral down. Or even a better way to think of it is like your brain being a record that's stuck, like mm -hmm. stuck on a scratch. Yep. And you therapy is a way to jump that scratch, to get out of that cycle that you're stuck in that has been leading to these patterns that you've developed. Therapy for me was so vital. And it still continues to be something that's incredibly vital for me because it gives me the perspective that I need and the distance that I need from this own like echo chamber of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I talk with people who are struggling with this, they're like, Oh, what are, what are the foods that you ate to overcome this? What is like, what are the things that I can do to get through this? It's like, you need to have someone objective who's trained in these kinds of things to be able to help you change your own thinking because no one food is going to fix you. It's like, it's so hard because when you're in the midst of an eating disorder, you just keep thinking, Oh, I, I just need to focus on the food and that's yeah, what's going to fix to me. And it's no, the opposite of that. Yeah. yeah. It's that it's the over-focus on food that it's the problem because mm -hmm. people with eating disorders, you just think about food all the time. And I see a lot of women who are stuck in the depths of an eating disorder who are just who want to cook all the time, who want to make a cookbook, who want to get a dietetics degree or something, because all they can think about is the food. And that's the, it's like this over-focus on it. And you need to be able to jump out of that thinking and change your relationship with food. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's a hard problem. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, yeah, I, I wish there was easier solutions to it, but it's like, it's, you almost need to change your entire way of thinking. And that's what treatment was for me. Yeah. I, had to so thoroughly change my worldview. And my worldview now is just so different from what it was four years ago in 2016 when I went into treatment. It's mm -hmm. like, I almost look back at that time and think of myself as a completely different person just based on what my thoughts were and what my thoughts were focused on so much of the time. So will you um, share with us maybe a few of the thoughts that maybe you did used to have that for someone listening it's like, oh my God, I have those thoughts. Like for me, I've often said it be like, you know, going out for dinner in two hours, I'm starving, but you can just eat some carrots and shut up because I'm I'm not giving you food now because I know I'm going to eat when I go out. Or it's an hour after lunch and I'm thinking, 
oh, are you serious? I'm hungry again. Like, well, I'm going to wait at least another hour because, you know, those were some of the things I used to think to myself. For someone listening, anything that you say where your mind was and where it is now, kind of what it was saying then and then what it either says now or what it says and then you respond to it differently, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I I 100% agree. Like I've had exactly those same thoughts. Like and I and I still struggle with those things and it's hard especially because as a pro runner now I'm like constantly having to fuel to like fuel my training so you're always having to think about eating. I think a big thing for me was separating out quote unquote good food from bad food. It's and this focus that like oh I can only eat certain things because those are what's going to fuel my training and I believed so thoroughly that it was like a I needed to figure out this equation of the exact amount of calories that I needed and exact in and out. And I couldn't, I couldn't eat anything over what my exact needs were. And it was always better to eat too little because if I ate too much, that was the worst thing in the world. And now my thinking has shifted in that I can't afford to eat too little. It's always better to be a little bit too much and have those extra energy reserves because otherwise you're just not going to have energy to train to get stronger in training. You need to have, and to build muscle and to build strength, you need to have some sort of surplus of energy in your body. And if you're constantly at a deficit, it's just not going to, to work out at least in the long term. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I, I think uh, I'm trying to like think of just, it's, it's so crazy because you just get sucked into just these weird weird thought patterns and weird relationships with food. And this idea like, Oh, like I can't eat white bread because white bread is so unhealthy, but I can eat wheat bread. Now it's like bread is bread. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, like there's, there's a time and a place for different foods, but I think a lot of people like I, it's kind of like why put it out on social media, like donuts. And part of that is because I didn't allow myself to eat donuts for like years. It's something that I like unabashedly enjoy and they have zero nutritional (laughs) value, but sometimes you just want to eat a guy's donut. Mm -hmm. And but when I was at the worst of my eating disorder, it was like, if I ate a donut, then I'd constantly be thinking about, oh my gosh, how is this going to affect my training? Everything's down the tube. Like I ate too many calories. This is not going to perfectly fuel my training. And now it's like, like, no, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Like you one donut isn't going to kill you. It's the, it's the sum total of what you're eating. And if you're doing, if you're eating well and fueling yourself well, like 80% of the time, you don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is like, sometimes you can just eat food for the hell of it. Cause food is about connecting to people and enjoying food. It doesn't have to just be to fuel your training. Yes. Sometimes sometimes it's about giving fewer shits about what you eat and just like along with it yeah well having the experience I mean that's that's a lot of what is robbed when you when you're deep in that is um the joy of going out for a meal with friends and and not spending the entire time over analyzing everything of whether you're giving away too much by getting something that's too small that people are going to be you know giving you the side eye or did you do too much and then you know it's it's take sucks all the fun out of it so thank you for that and and one more thing on this topic and then we'll start to move on um uh, for someone who's thinking, well, I'm not bad enough. I'm, I don't weigh 95 pounds. Um, they, they recognize all the thoughts, all the things we're talking about, but they're saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that skinny. I don't need to go in to get treatment or to work on this yet. I'm just, you know, yeah, okay. Maybe I'm a little, a little, um, obsessed with healthy eating, but it's just cause I want to perform to my best. Anything else you'd say to that person? Yeah, I would say that if anything, that's the, if you find yourself obsessively thinking about food, trying to control certain things or feeling like it's becoming a stress in your life. Like that's when it's almost more important to address it early on before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, going through treatment, one statistic that I was given by, by my doctor is that with eating disorders, the earlier you address them and the earlier you address disordered eating, it doesn't even need to be a a quote unquote eating Mm -hmm. disorder. It doesn't need to get to the point where you have lost a ton of weight, where you're experiencing bone loss, hormonal disruptions. The sooner you address it, the sooner you can be through it. A third of people who get to the point of having full medically diagnosed eating disorder will never recover. A third will die from it. 
and a third will recover, but still probably experience symptoms throughout their lives. So like if you can address disordered eating and negative thought patterns and work to have a healthier relationship with food early on, you don't have to risk becoming one of those statistics. Like I had an eating disorder for long enough and I have had it for long enough that I will probably never be over this. Like I'm probably going to be in that third of people that will probably like deal with this the rest of my life. Cause I still deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that's because I did not get treatment early enough. I let it get to the point where I was like basically dying. And so it's like, I want other people to be able to recognize these negative patterns early enough that they don't have to deal with it, that they can combat it early enough. Think about it. Like you would any other running injury. If you're feeling soreness in your knee or like your leg or something, you try to address it early. So it doesn't turn into a stress fracture. So it doesn't turn into a torn ligament. We need to think of eating disorders like that. We need to address it early on and nip it in the bud so that it doesn't become a huge thing that people have to go to treatment for four months and then deal with the rest of their lives. Good point. Good point. That's such a good point. Thank you so much. And then, you know, as, as you've stepped into the the pro running world, um, the elite running world, have you seen a difference there in in the approach that the women and, and men, but particularly women take towards their eating there? Like, do you see the same things you saw in college or do you feel like people generally have a, a healthier relationship? No, I feel like it's pro running has so much of a healthier relationship towards eating simply because the majority of like you cannot perform at this level and for as for the length of time that you need to, to be a good, a good pro runner and extend your career. If you have an eating disorder, mm-hmm. like you look at someone like Jenny Simpson, who's been performing at a top level for basically over a decade at this point, or like Molly, any of these women, you need to be able to be fueling your body correctly and maintaining a high level of health and strength in order to go at this level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. most people with eating disorders, you break down. Like I broke down after basically a year and a half of a serious eating disorder. And, and then after that, even through recovery, I've dealt with severe bone injuries and had to get surgery and all of this stuff because of my negative habits in that mm-hmm. sense. Like I'm still dealing with low bone density from it. And I'm think I'm very lucky in that I was able to overcome a lot of these things, but the majority of people don't. And Mm so I think that a lot of people who deal with serious eating disorders, they just can't get to this level because your body breaks down too soon. So it really kind of, it, it has helped reinforce my own recovery. Now being at the pro level and having a lot of positive influences around me in the women that I see performing at this level. Like I look at Molly Huddle and I say like, this is someone that I like, I want to be able to have a career as long as she's had. So I need to eat well and do as well as I can nutritionally so that my body can continue to perform 10 years from now, yeah. not just in the immediate, like now. Mm-hmm. And that again, ties back to the looking at college and high school athletes and, you know, for, for them, for, for us, as we were in it, looking at the professional runners, they all look lean, thin, ripped, and you see all these things and you think that's what I need to look like, but you don't see that they've got 10, 20 years of training under their belt. And that has what has slowly kind of defined their bodies, not the controlling and the, as you said, they wouldn't survive otherwise. And that's the hard message I think that gets lost in translation with high school and college is that, you know, in high school and college, you've still got, as a woman, you've still got that slightly like I want to say like puffy, but you're still kind of, you know, your body is, is changing and growing and, um, and developing. And, um, but we look at those bodies and I remember looking at my body and being like, oh, like I look nothing like the fast people, but really they've got all those years of training that have slowly taken their body to that place. So that's where we've got to figure yeah. out how to get that well, message. And even, even just the sense of like, you see Shalane Flanagan running the New York marathon and she's just freaking so lean and ripped. And I think she is just naturally a very lean person, but bodies don't necessarily look like that mm-hmm. throughout the entire year. Like I know for me, I've had to like really figure out how to fluctuate my weight in a healthy way throughout the season. So like, as I get closer to a goal race, as I'm like super high mileage training for the marathon, that will probably be my lowest weight of the year. That's like 
because your weight will just kind of naturally drop as you get ready for a big race and your body's going through so much training and stress. And then you go through a rest period and I let myself like regain weight and get back like to a little bit like more healthy, sustainable weight. Like you can't, you simply can't be super lean 12 months out of the year. And that's something that I didn't realize when I was in college. And now I have a better sense of that when I feel myself like being too lean, like kind of getting close to that edge. I know like, okay, I need to maybe take a step back. Thank you to my wonderful friends at Ultra for allowing me to do a giveaway for providing 12 pairs of shoes for my community for free. And you can enter to win a pair every month, a pair of Ultra shoes of your choice. You can go to ultrarunning.com and you can pick whichever ones you want, whichever ones your heart desires. If you are the winner each month, if you enter once during any month, you will be entered automatically into every month following that for the rest of the year. And I'm so thankful that I have a sponsor who is not only willing to help me, but also help my community because I realize that running shoes can be expensive or, you know, it can be kind of scary to try a new brand. And I'm, I'm excited that they give the opportunity for people to try new brands. But also I love hearing your feedback about how you are enjoying the switch when you make that change over to Ultra. It is just makes my heart so happy hearing how much you appreciate it. And just as I haven't done it in a while, a reminder, my favorite shoes, I love the Escalante. That's probably my favorite of all. Uh, the Torin is a great shoe if you want to make a transition over to Ultra and you're using another brand. Uh, I also love the Cayenta for racing and the Escalante Racer for racing. And uh, the Provision is actually one with a kind of more of a, a support, like a arch support within it. Um, and I've really been enjoying that kind of in my pregnancy time because uh, it helps with my arches, which as many of you know, uh, are not particularly good at holding themselves up during the end of pregnancy. So that's one that I have really been enjoying there. So you can go to tinamuir.com forward slash ultra. That's tinamuir.com forward slash A-L-T-R-A. And you can enter to win a free pair every month. And now I have a better sense of that when I feel myself like being too lean, like kind of getting close to that edge. I know like, okay, I need to maybe take a step back or like, or after a big, like after the trials, I like, I took a little bit of a break. I'm still kind of in a break where I'm lower mileage and I am like letting myself be able to like, like gain some weight back, like so that I can get ready for the next training cycle. Yep. Thank you for a good point as well. And especially high school in particular, you're racing so much with those seasons. You, don't you race in high school like three or four times a week? Oh my God. So it's insane. Never, yeah. Ne- never get that chance. And same with college, I guess you get that three months in the summer, but that's your like base building. You're supposed to be putting in the hard work. So yeah, I think that is another message that we need to get across. So, if, and I just, I, I think this is interesting to talk about because the change has got to happen there. Um, so the more conversations we can have about this, hopefully the more it will begin to sink in. Um, now, you know, you've mentioned you had quite a few injuries. Um, h- how did that, the injury cycle kind of not destroy your relationship with running kind of to the point to where you thought, you know what, this isn't worth it. Like, is is there anything you think was able to, to hold that mental side of you to, to keep that joy within Uh, the sport? I, a part of it is, is I think I'm just like, I've had like so many ups and downs to this point. And like, truthfully, even just last summer when I re-injured my hip again, a year after my surgery and my hip, I had, basically this, the story behind that, the, like with my nutritional deficiencies throughout college, I had broken my pelvic ear. It did not fuse back together. So I ran on a broken hip effectively for a year mm. as a pro and then figured it out, had to get surgery, didn't run for six months. And then I thought, okay, I'm good to go. Like I went through this horrible six month period where I never thought I was going to be able to run again. Let's train. And then six months into that basically had another scare about fracturing my hip. and. I thought, I kind of thought that was it. I was in so much pain. I thought that was going to be the end of the career and wondering like, okay, like, do I have it in me to keep coming back again? Do I have it in me to take another cycle of rest, recovery, slow comeback? And I didn't know if I had it in me. And I think part of it is just I think there's something off in my brain that I just am too dumb to give this up. Like that's truthfully it. I think I'm just too stubborn or like Mm. obstinate to give it up. 
but also that I do have a lot of like positive influences on me that, uh, after it actually, or after that injury, I called my college coach sparks and basically was like crying on the phone to him. Like, I think this is it. Like, I, I don't know if I can do this again. He's like, no, like you're going to do what you always do. You'll get through this. Like you just need to be patient and you just need to know that like you can do this. And so having those kinds of positive influences in my life has been huge for me getting yeah. through a lot of these struggles. Cause I've had so many points, like so many points where you're just kind of, you feel like you're sitting at the bottom of the well, looking up and wondering how you're going to climb out. And a lot of times it just helps with someone throwing down a rope to you and saying that it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and it's good that you have people like that in your life. And I would hope most people listening either have someone like that in their life, or if they don't, they feel comfortable, you know, reaching out to, to someone that you, you look up to online, even just to say, you know, I need, I need just someone to listen or someone to be there for me for just a minute. So I hope, you know, i I know I say this a lot, but Molly, probably the same with you. Like if, if you really need someone to just give you that little, um, spark of life, then, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to other people as well. Um, okay. So, you know, this happened again last year and then, uh, at 2016, you had to watch the trials, um, with, with an injury there as well. Um, just before we get on to the 2020 trials, um, at that moment when you were, not where you wanted to be, uh, you know, hoping that you would have a shot of making an Olympic team, but having a sacral stress fracture and a- unable to do it. Did you kind of decide at that moment, like 2020, I'm going to do everything I can? Like, was the last four years all about this Olympic cycle or was, could you not even allow yourself to mentally go there because of what you'd been through with all your injuries in the past? No, I think my problem in 2016 is that I was so obsessed with the Olympics is like my main goal. I was like, I have to make an Olympic team. That was like, I was like, I will like find self-actualization and I will be my truest self. If I make the Olympic team, like this is the only thing that matters to me. And because I was holding on to that dream so tight, I broke it. Like I physically broke. Um, and then basically that experience was the impetus to go into eating disorder treatment to get myself right. And and it's something that I've worked over the last four years. Um, it's kind of funny because obviously like the Olympics was my biggest goal, but it, I don't want to say that it mattered less to me, but I had a much looser grip on that dream than I'd ever had going into 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, even it's funny cause in the lead up to the 2016 or the, sorry, the, the 2020 marathon trials, I had had multiple conversations with people that like, I had reached the point where I knew like, okay, I'm going to go into these trials and like, I'm just going to run it. Like, I don't expect to make this team. And I realized at this point, like based on my injury history, based on my inexperience, based on the fact that I haven't been able to get a lot of solid training in the last four years because of my injuries, that it might never happen. And I came to the acceptance with myself that even if I never made an Olympic team, the fact that I was able to do what I loved and train as a pro runner and live this dream. Like this has been a dream my whole life to be a pro runner. Even if I never achieved that highest goal, it was still going to be worth it for me mm-hmm. because when I was coming back from surgery, like, I had that fact of like, okay, like you, based on your injury history, you might never get a chance to, to do this for real. Like, are you willing to put in this amount of time and effort and pain to never make an Olympic team? Is it worth it for you? And I, like kind of came to the realization, like, yeah, it's worth it regardless. Like if I get a shot to go for it, even if I never make it, it's worth it. Yes. And so that's why I think it's funny that I made it like this time around with zero expectations, because it's like, I was so focused on it in 2016. And this time around, I was like, you know what? Like it does making an Olympic team. Isn't going to make you realize yourself as a human. You've kind of got to come to that realization yourself of like, yes, I'm a person beyond this. So it's kind of cool that it happened now. Yeah. And I absolutely, honestly, I think that's, that's why it happened. I mean, no doubt you put in the work, you have the talent, you have the the mental strength, absolutely those things. But we see it so often, don't we? Like, and, and 
I don't even see it just at that, obviously see it with people like you at that level, but also a lot of the people listening, they say, I really want that BQ. I need that BQ. I have to get that BQ because without it, I'm I'm not, you know, I don't believe that I'm a runner or whatever it may be. They have these goals and they go like banging their head against a brick wall year after year, trying trying to reach these things. And yeah, I often say to people, it's only when you let go of that kind of, um, that pressure to that, like, you like you said, the self-actualization, like when I, when I do this, I'm going to be happy. Or like when people say, I just need to make a hundred thousand dollars a year and then I'll be happy. Or when we put these artificial things on our lives and we just are so focused on them, not so much the journey and the challenge. And like you said, doing it for the love of doing it rather than the reward at the end. I think, I really think that's, that's why it kind of came together for you that way, because yeah, you didn't have the expectations. Your you, your mind was free to do the best it could, and I just think that's amazing and such a good lesson for people for people listening right now. Because yes, yeah, you're not trying to make an Olympic team, but you can apply it to your own life um, with whatever goals you are going for. So, thank you for 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 sharing that with us and and giving us that wisdom with that. And you know, going into it, you kind of said that you were just kind of happy to just be able to have a shot to do it, to, to be on the start line after not like not being there on, um, uh, in 2016. So, you know, did, did any part of you seem bothered by the fact that, you know, there was all these kind of favorites that people were focusing on and, and people were like, Oh, who is this Molly who's come out of nowhere? Or did you kind of like that you were kind of, um, not the dark horse, but you weren't even the dark horse. You were just kind of the inexperienced one who just happened to be hanging in with the group. Yeah. I, I think truthfully, like I didn't have a whole lot of ego involved in it. Like I knew coming in, like I, I, but I think I had to be at that point just because of the circumstances surrounding it. Like I did not get to start on the front line. I was back in wave three. I like leading into it. There's kind of like, we had this joke among Saucony. Like I was like discount Molly because like, (laughs) there's like the real Molly, like Molly (laughs) Huddle. But, um, yeah. Uh, but and that's all like very joking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I love Saki. Um, but yeah, I think like going into it, realizing like, okay, like I haven't done anything to earn the respect. Like I shouldn't, I don't ever assume that I should be treated in a certain way because of anything that I've done in the past. And especially now with like, just like how stacked that women's field was, yeah. like, I don't expect anyone to be like, Oh, well, this girl was a full locker champion in high school. We should give her a spot. Like, no, you have to earn that respect. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so going into it, I was like, I have never run a marathon. I've sure. I ran like, okay. in the half leading into this, but I, okay. I need to, <laughs> yes. <laughs> One ten. yes I, okay. I ran fairly. Uh, yeah. I ran <laughs> better than I expected to run in the Houston half leading into it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, like, but regardless of that, like there were a lot of very talented women yeah. and very experienced women. And I couldn't expect to be like, I don't know, going into it, I was like, okay, I want to keep an open mind and use this as a learning experience, not sell myself short. Like I want to go out and perform to my highest level, but I, yeah, I couldn't expect to like, when you're going against all of these women who are like Olympians and who have run like 222 in the marathon before. And I'm just like some kid that decided to do this. It's like, yeah, I, I didn't want to go into it with an ego Mm -hmm. and expect that I a certain way. So no, I like leading into it. It did not like bother me that I wasn't on any like list or anything. Cause why, why the hell would I be? It's Mm -hmm. like, I'd never run the thing before. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was almost kind of fun. Like being able to like fly under the radar like that. And and not have a whole lot of pressure on it going into it. Like I could just go out and I mean, there was no expectation on it. So once I found my, yeah. And that's the thing is like, when I found myself in the front, well, I was like, well, I don't know what this should feel like regardless. So, I mean, sure. Might as well just stay up at the front as long Mm -hmm. as I can. So, you know, you must've heard like, I don't want to say horror stories, but heard, you know, I remember people saying to me before I did my first, like, you'll, you'll never know the, the the struggle and the pain in your legs of a marathon until you do it. And I remember thinking like, whatever, like I'm, I'm tough. I can handle whatever comes that way. Um, and then, it, you know, I remember experiencing it in my first, um, but you know, when you, when you pulled away with Alephine and you were running ahead of all these names, like you said, Olympians, people would run two twenty twos. all these, you know, so many of them that 
did any part of you kind of think like, oh, they know something I don't like, how is this going to, could this come back to me? Like, was any part of you panicking that these people were behind you? Um, so in that race, I had like, I was definitely worried, but the majority of my nerves were surrounding the race itself, not necessarily the competition. I had kind of told myself beforehand, I'm just going to pretend that I don't know who any of these women are. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to pretend like I don't know who Desi Lynn is, (laughs) that I don't know who Molly Huddle is and not attach anything to that. They're just women that I'm running against. My main fears in that race were, Oh my God, what if I can't finish this? Because I have literally never run 26 miles in my life Mm -hmm. and I've never run that fast for that long. So I truthfully had hyped it up so much in my head of how much it was going to hurt Mm. that I felt like if anything, I was very prepared for the worst case scenario on that day. I was much more mentally prepared for it being the worst experience in my life and having to potentially drop out and all that kind of stuff. So truthfully, it was kind of weird then getting to mile 18 and still feeling like, oh, my legs actually feel like, I mean, they hurt, they don't feel good, but they feel better than I expected to. And Mm -hmm. then at mile 20, when we started pulling away, I was like, oh, this is like really weird right now. Like, but I, I kept going at the pace that I felt good maintaining. I was like, I don't want to slow down right now just because all of these women are here. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to slow down just because I'm worried about running in front of Des Linden. I want to keep running at the pace that I feel comfortable at. So when I made that surge at mile 19 and Alphine went with me and then ultimately she took over and we kept running at that pace. I'm not going to lie. Those were the literally the most painful last six miles Mm -hmm. of like my life. It was horrible, but I felt like I was very mentally prepared for just how much it was going to hurt Mm -hmm. because I had hyped it up so much in my mind for it to just be the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Well, well, I guess that's a good thing, you know, in hindsight, because there's so many of us go the other way, which I definitely did. Um, do you think it would have been any different had it not been, had it been someone else other than Alephine? Like, you know, we've heard that she was, you know, saying a few things to you, you were kind of supporting one another, you somewhat knew one another. Do you see it being different? Had it been someone who hadn't, wouldn't have said anything to you, was just trying to get rid of you. Do you think the race would have turned out any different in that way? Or you not so much the race, but your mental a- approach would have changed in any way. Yes. I think that I would have been less, um, maybe less positive about it because I felt like despite how much it hurt those last six miles, I felt like I was in a really good mental place with it because it was Alphine Mm -hmm. because she is a friend of mine and she is just wholeheartedly such a supportive person. And she wasn't trying to like drop me hard. She was running really hard. Um, and she made it very clear that she wasn't going to slow down to like, but Wait, she yeah. kept pushing me to stay with her. Yeah. yeah. And so that was the, that was the positivity that I needed. I don't know if I'd have been able to hang with her as long as I did, if it hadn't been her and if she hadn't been quite as positive about it, because it did feel like, okay, this is like, obviously we are teammates, but Mm -hmm. I feel like we are working together here and we're working towards a common goal Mm -hmm. because we knew that there were a lot of really good women behind us and we were going to have to separate in order for us to be able to like secure our spots on the team. So it was definitely like that feeling of camaraderie and like, okay, let's work towards a a higher goal of just I want to make a team. It's that we want to make a team. Yeah. I love that so much. And that was pretty clear from watching it and, and especially at the finish as well, just so cool. And, and as you've said, Alephine is just such a beautiful person inside and out that, um, she, you know, was the perfect person for you to have alongside you with that. Um, so that's just really cool. And then coming into the finish, you know, I know we're not spending much time on the trials, but there's plenty of other podcasts out there, um, (laughs) that have kind of talked about this aspect of things. And, um, I know Lindsay Hine has one, so you can go listen to that one for sure. But coming into the finishing area, when you kind of realized, okay, this, this is actually happening. I'm making this team. What were the things that were going through your mind? Were you thinking about what you, you know, all the injuries, were you thinking about overcoming the eating disorder? Were you thinking about all the people involved? Was there something? I think you're giving me a little bit more credit for how my, how exhausted I was (laughs) being able to think about things. Um, no, I I think there was like a, a sense of like, 
happiness and relief of like, Oh my God, I never thought I would get here. Like I never thought that I would be in this position to do this again. Um, because like after my surgery, yeah, it was only a 50% chance that I was ever straight up going to be able to run again. Mm -hmm. So like even just as recently as last summer, like if someone had told me even that I'd be running at the Olympic trials, I probably would have laughed because I didn't know if I was going to be able to maintain high mileage again at that point. I didn't know if I'd be able to train for a marathon. So like coming through that shoot, having my family there, having my friends there and the people who had gotten me through basically the worst time in my life, all being able to there, being there to get to celebrate this and share this with me was really, really special. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's just like, I don't know, the energy of that day in Atlanta was absolutely insane. Like it's like no race I've ever had. And like, you're coming downhill into the finishing shoot. You're so tired, but you just like have so much energy and you're so excited because it's like, Oh my God, like I'm literally going to the Olympics and you're like carrying that tiny little American flag. And Which, yeah, how did they give like that to you? How did, did they gave it to us way too early? Like they gave it to us yeah, 600 was, meters from the finish. Know, oh my God. I, like did someone I've, shove I've it into your hand or like, did you grab it off someone? So uh, they were like, there was a person who was holding a bunch of them. And so as we passed, they kind of held it out. And luckily at that point I was used to picking up water bottles at speed. So I kind of just grabbed it, but yeah, they gave it to us like a ways yeah, from the finish. I'm like, there is still a lot of room for Sally to Diego <laughs> to like dust me on this. And like, I was wondering like, if someone passes you, do they like snatch your flag then? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be taking that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's like flag football. Just like, yoink, that's mine. Um, <laughs> But yeah, luckily, luckily we had a little bit of a gap, so I didn't have to worry about it. But, um, yeah, it's kind of like you, you come through like waving your tiny flag and you're able to celebrate a little bit, but I, then you get through the finishing shoot and you're so excited and all my friends were there and I wanted to like run over to them and I'm like, Oh God, my legs, legs won't yeah. move. <laughs> it's yeah. like, once you, once you stop oh, moving, yeah. then it's all. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And when, especially that being your first, you wouldn't, wouldn't have expected that part to be the part that, you, you know, you see races on TV and people just like carry on and they go running and waving and, um, yeah, you, oh my God. No. <laughs> you think about, um, like, how they look. Kind of like hauling my legs through. <laughs> yeah. It's so different from like finishing a 10 K or a 5 K on the roads. Cause you're uh, like aerobically so exhausted mm -hmm. at the end of those, but your legs feel so pretty good. So you can like run around and do stuff afterwards. After this, like my lungs felt pretty good, mm -hmm. but my legs were just like, nope, not today, <laughs> junior. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for, for your honesty with that part as well. Okay, just wrapping up here. Um, how did you handle all the, the media um, kind of swirling around you after this race? I mean, um, I, I did feel bad for Alephine and I'm sure you did too, that like most of the focus did seem to be on you. Um, for kind of making this team and your debut, which is incredibly impressive. I, I, I mean, I just, yeah, admit but I, little, I but think the media definitely played it up a lot though. Like that did was, you handle that. Okay. Was that like a lot of, yeah. Like, so oh. I, I was a, truthfully quite upset with the fact that they were one, Oh, like not paying as much attention to Alphine as they should have, because she is the winner of the Olympic trials. Like you should pay attention to her. And I think unfortunately, like, a lot of people, because she was born in Kenya, like they all, they're like, Oh, we want to focus on the white girl. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is, that's so wildly inappropriate mm -hmm. because Alphine, if anything is literally the American dream. Like yeah. she came over here, had lived here, been an American citizen and earned her place. Like if anything, like I have just like some random kid born in Wisconsin, like I had a very easy life. Like, to get here. And so it made me very upset that they just wanted to focus on me as like, Oh yeah, the plucky barista who just decided to start running three months ago and now made the team. It's like, no, you're not like, <laughs> that's not what the story is. Like mm -hmm. I'm a professional runner who works a side hustle as a barista because Boston is really expensive to live. But yeah. And same with Sally. I feel like they totally overshadowed Sally Kipiego mm -hmm. just because like, I don't know. It's the whole kind of climate in the U S right now of like, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of like disrespecting the immigrant story. And if anything, I feel like those two stories are far more impressive than mine. And so it's like, yeah, that's something that I struggled with a lot afterwards and a lot of guilt surrounding yeah. that. Um, yeah, it was, it was a madhouse afterwards, truthfully. Um, 
uh, obviously a lot of it has calmed down now because of the whole coronavirus crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really crazy. It, like really crazy going from just the media blitz after the trials to then the Olympics being postponed and the question of whether or not we were going to keep our spots on the team and just everything. So it's been really a crazy last month and a half. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely would believe it. And, and how are you mentally handling that aspect? Like, do you feel at peace or not at peace, but kind of, okay, well, that gives me another year to kind of get myself trained or do you, do you feel really disappointed? Like, oh, this was my, you know, I was ready to go this summer. Yeah, obviously there's disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, disappointment not getting to race the Olympics in August, but knowing like, okay, like uh, if anything, like as a 25 year old who's only run one marathon, yeah. like I, I am actually looking forward to having this opportunity to train for an extra year, hopefully get in another marathon in the fall and just get some more training under my belt because I am just realistically, I'm extremely inexperienced at this. And like, I could stand to, to practice a little bit more. Um, I do really feel for some of the older athletes or like women who wanted to start mm -hmm. families who, mm -hmm. um, yeah, were kind of towards the more the tail end of their careers. who kind of want to start moving on. It's really hard. So I, I want to be compassionate for like everybody in this and realize like, okay, like for me personally, this isn't a huge, like it's obviously disappointing, but it's not going to affect me all that much. Whereas for someone who's in their thirties, it's a much different story. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so you think they made the right choice? Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't, I think they should have probably made the decision a little bit sooner than yeah. they did. I think frankly, it was kind of ridiculous after everything started shutting down and then them maintaining, no, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Even once USATF canceled the entire season, like a lot of my friends race track. And so it's like, how are they going to get mm -hmm. their qualifiers? That's just not the standard that we want to hold for the Olympics when not everybody gets an equal chance to try and qualify. Yeah. Or even if you go beyond running and you think about a sport like swimming, when they shut down all the swimming pools. Yeah. Uh, if you don't do. have access well, to a gym, like what are you going to do? So, <laughs> yeah. And if only certain countries were going to get to go, that's not what the Olympics mm -hmm. is about. If no. they're holding it and spectators can't go, that's not what the Olympics no. is about. Yeah. Like yeah. we want to be able to make it safe and healthy for everyone. Yep. Well, Molly, thank you so much for your, your honesty, your vulnerability, for just being a bright, shining light in this world. I really appreciate you and all that you've done and your advice to, to the listeners out there today. So thank you so much and congratulations on your success so far. I look forward to many more successes in the future. Thanks so much, Tina. It was great talking to you. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. I have to be honest, I knew I would like Molly. I didn't realize I would love her quite that much. And uh, I really look forward to following her in the future and getting to hopefully get to know her even more as a person. I really resonated with that realness about her, that rawness, just her, her, her bubbly personality, but mixed with that kind of like punch of vulnerability where she doesn't mind sharing the struggles. I really think this woman is going to be doing some special things and I can't wait to see what it is over the future. Now, you can find links to everything that we talked about today, including, as I mentioned uh, before the episode, you can have, there are links to the National Eating Disorder Association's uh, website and hotline, the episodes of my podcast that are focused on kind of eating disorder recovery, if you think that might speak to you. Um, and also the links to anything else that Molly and I mentioned in the show. There will also be links to our sponsors for today, Tracksmith, Ultra and Athletic Greens. You can get discounts. You can enter to win a free pair of Ultra shoes every month from going to the show notes and clicking on that link. You can get 15% off your order at Tracksmith and you can get uh, 20 free servings of Athletic Greens. Go to those links, go support those companies. They're genuine. I really scout out my products and I do not say yes to very many companies. So. Um, I pride myself on being honest with you about that. 
So you can find those links at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 193. Now, next week, we have an episode that Sarah Crouch recorded with Matt Fitzgerald, a wonderful conversation between two friends who just were having a ball, having a blast, I should say, um, having a blast uh, discussing his um, experience going up to Flagstaff to live kind of as an elite. If you've ever wondered what it is like to be an elite runner, if you were going to train for a race and really go for it, Matt got to experience that. And he did end up having the race of his life. It was pretty cool, but they talk about that and his new book. So make sure that you go to subscribe if you have not already. So you can get that one right to your phone or your favorite podcast player as soon as it comes up. My friends, I want you to to remind you to have a great week, to be kind to yourself, be kind to this world we live in. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.